Vater, ich erwähne ihn, ich bitte, ich sage ihn, Amen. So, St. John Damascene is uh, called the last of the church fathers. Uh, the church fathers were those men who, were, who came early in the history of the church, uh, whom God raised up to help shape the understanding of the church and clarify her uh, teachings and dogmas. Uh, in the beginning, there were so many questions, so many uh, precedents to be set about how the church would understand um, uh, Christ's human and divine nature. How would the church approach uh, uh, a confession, the sacraments, forgiveness, uh, morality? Like so, so many things in the early church were being established, and the church fathers were those men whom God inspired uh, to do it properly. So that, that's part of our uh, unbroken uh, line of, of well, just apostolic succession, but also the, the uh, non-contradiction of the church. Everything that has been developed over the centuries, all the theological understandings are consistent with what has been there from the very beginning. I mean, it, it just kind of, when you really think about it, how is it that all these men in the, in the early church just so happened to get all these finer points of doctrine exactly correct? so that they didn't contradict anything that came before or anything that came after, even up to a thousand years. Right? That obviously has to be the Holy Ghost. So St. John Damascene is one of them, and he, he was born in the year 675 and died somewhere around 754. Uh, he's called the last of the church fathers, uh, because by that point, you know, after 700 and some years, uh, that, that, um, that foundation ha had been uh, established. Um, he's also uh, one of the Greek fathers. There were, there were, there were Latin, speaking, Latin speaking fathers and Greek speaking fathers, they're, they're their primary language in which they wrote. And he was one of the Greek fathers, writing uh, primarily in that language. Um, also, he uh, was named a doctor of the church uh, later, later on. Uh, so, uh, uh, for all those reasons, very important in the church, St. John Damascene. And he grew up in a society, uh, interestingly, that was... Um, it was transitioning. He, uh, in, in the year 675, that was about f nearly 50 years after uh, Muhammad had come on the scene and united the disparate nomadic peoples in the Arab Peninsula under this new um, over culture way of life called Islam, right? Uh, so Muhammad had just come in spreading his infernal doctrine, um, uniting these people under, unfortunately, that... that um, uh, parasitic way of thinking, uh, which Islam is. And uh, until that point, uh, Damascus, which is where he's from, Damascus, the whole area, had been primarily Byzantine. It was, it was conquered by Bi the Byzantine Catholic Church, um, uh, you know, or, or Orthodox, or various, various versions of, of the Catholic faith. Um, and they had inherited Byzantine culture. It was, it was very rich. I mean, the Byzantine culture was a thousand years old. That was inheriting uh, the, the, from the Greeks, from that, the, the early uh, philosophical thought of Aristotle and, and so on. And that had been developed, right, over that course of a thousand years. So a very rich, very uh, um, 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 uh, productive history there, uh, a Christian history. Uh, but that was that would soon to change. Fifty years, a caliphate had been established, uh, a sultan had taken control, and so we had this very strange um, uh, uh, situation of this Christian culture that was now controlled by this new religion, Islam. But Islam did not have a rich history, did not have a rich past, and so you ended up with Christian um, uh, theologians, philosophers, uh, government officials who were running the kingdom for these Islamic sultans. That was kind of this, this strange um, uh, uh, phenomena going on at the time. So uh, John Damascene was born to his, his uh, parents who would not convert to Islam, but the, the, the Muslims left them alone because they were so useful. They, they knew how to administer a kingdom. So uh, John Damascene, uh, his father was very pious and he would use his wealth and influence to ransom uh, these Christian slaves, these, these uh, pirates who go raiding and take slaves, uh, John Damascene's father would rescue them. One of the slaves that he rescued was a monk named Cosmas, who, had, who was an excellent teacher, skilled in philosophy and theology, as I mentioned, and that was hard to find in those Islamic-controlled uh, countries, because the, the religion of Islam is irrational at its very root. 
And so when, when these, these Muslims would, be, would come across learning and education, it would refute their religion. So of course, what do you do? Get rid of learning and education in, to various degrees over the centuries. So St. John Damascene uh, received an excellent education from this uh, rescued monk named Cosmas and uh, uh, became, uh, was a brilliant student. And as he got older, uh, he was given a position in the government administration of the Sultan, just like his father had. Uh, but even though he was, he was very valuable to the, to the, to the Sultan, very uh, uh, well-read, very well-educated, he had a calling to be a monk. And so uh, when he was about 30 years old, he left his position in, in the, uh, um, the caliphate and he entered a monastery uh, near Jerusalem. And he would, have, he would have stayed there the rest of his life, you know, just doing monk things. Uh, but God was going to make use of his education. And interestingly, God would make use of his position in that uh, Islamic empire. Uh, for at this time, around the years, early 700s, uh, there was a heresy of iconoclasm. Iconoclasm is the idea that um, uh, icons and statues and pictures of the saints ought not to be venerated. That's something that just keeps cropping up over the years. So this was a, this was a small problem in the empire that became a big problem when the emperor became an iconoclast. Emperor Leo III decreed that no public veneration of images should take place. Uh, so images began to be destroyed, people were hiding them, uh, people were persecuted, I think some, some people even, were even killed. And the emperor forbid any cleric, any, any bishop or whatever to preach against iconoclasm. So this, this gag order. We've seen that before, right? Basically, this is the, the eighth century version of canceling priests and bishops. You can't speak out against iconoclasm. Uh, but St. John Damascene, he was an Arab-controlled uh, country. He, he didn't have to abide by the, 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 the decrees of the emperor. So St. John Damascene was one of the very few uh, men in the church who could oppose the emperor's unjust decree of iconoclasm. And so he did. He wrote three works against uh, um, uh, this, this heresy, and the emperor, emperor was furious because he couldn't do anything about it. He, he, could, he could complain to the sultan, but the sultan was like, what do I care about your religious disputes? So St. John Damascene was, was, was instrumental in uh, um, opposing the iconoclasm of the 8th century, and his writings would be used in the Second Council of Nicaea in 787, which formally condemned iconoclasm and established that as the official church doctrine. Veneration of icons, of pictures, of statues is good for the soul, good and praiseworthy for the spiritual life. Uh, so that was one, one of uh, St. John Damascene's uh, accomplishments, but um, you know, it doesn't come without a price. Uh, the emperor was, was so angry at John Damascene for having opposed him that he had drafted a spurious letter, supposedly from John Damascene, that was plotting the, uh, the downfall of Damascus. So the emperor sent this forgery to the sultan who, in, um, to punish John Damascene for his supposed uh, treachery, had his hand cut off. Um, and St. John Damascene uh, uh, prayed to Our Lady. In fact, he went before an icon of Our Lady, the Theotokos, and prayed before her. And uh, it is said that he fell asleep, and then when he woke up, his hand was restored to him. And for this reason, uh, you'll see on, on certain icons of Our Lady, there's a little silver hand in the right-hand corner. It's just, it looks a little bit weird just sitting there. So if, you see, if you've ever seen that, that is St. John Damascene's hand that was cut off and restored to him. Uh, now, there, there are some people that say that this is a kind of a spurious legend, that, that, that the, the, the um, accounts of this uh, happening aren't very reliable, and that's true. Uh, um, there aren't, there's, there's some disagreement about, okay, is this legitimate or not? But as usual, I would rather believe uh, about the saints, uh, I would rather believe the miracles than disbelieve them, because God is certainly within God's power to do that, and it's certainly consistent with what we hear in the other lives of the saints. So I have no problems believing such, um, uh, such legends um, as truth. 
Mm. He also um, is very well known for composing many works of religious poetry, and he used um, his, this poetry to expound theological truths and defend them from attacks and errors. And this is part of the, um, the reason that he's, he's considered a doctor of the church, is that his writings show uh, very early on what was the church, what was the mind of the church, what, what was she um, protesting, what was she um, fighting against as heresies, and what, how was she explaining truths. Um, another one is he wrote a great number of works on our, our Blessed Mother, especially on her Assumption. In fact, in some places, uh, sometimes he's called the Doctor of the Assumption. He wrote so much on that mystery. Um, he also compiled a summary of all the teachings of the previous Greek fathers. So St. Basil, St. Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory Nazianzen, John Chrysostom, Seal of Alexandria, St. Athanasius. He compiled and collected all their works and wrote it down in one volume uh, called The Fountain of Wisdom. And it's been, it's been said that this book of John Damascene has been called the Summa Theologica of, of the East, of, the, of, the, of Byzantium. Uh, so a tremendous amount of work and influence from St. John Damascene, and his death uh, cannot be fixed with great certainty, but generally uh, given around 754. Uh, so um, important for us to know, important for us to know these early uh, church fathers, uh, who they were, what they did, how they influenced the church, and how they safeguarded that deposit of faith. Um, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, uh, the prophets were always, they were always looking forward to Christ, prophesying what Christ would do, prophesying what, what the Messiah would say, what he would be like, and so they're like facing towards Calvary. Ever since Calvary, it's the same thing. The fathers face towards Christ, and they don't prophesy what he's going to do, but what he did do, what he did say, and, and what he did, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the things he did institute. So that's how we ought to look at history, before Christ is facing him, after Christ is facing him, and that's what we have here uh, with the testimony of the fathers. They're not inventing doctrine, they're safeguarding, preserving it, and explaining it. Uh, so let's thank God for having given us the, the deposit of, of the faith. Thank him for giving us the magisterium, right? The, the kind of the, 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 the New Testament version of the prophets. And, and realize that, that nothing can ever contradict what has come before. Doesn't matter who they are or how high their position in the church. Uh, they cannot contradict uh, uh, Christ our Lord, the scriptures, or the early church fathers. So that's, that's their great function uh, in our faith today. So we need to know who they are and what they wrote. So St. John Damascene, pray for us. God bless you all. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.